Rostov on Don, Russia, October 1982. A special task force is desperately searching for a serial killer. The investigation had begun four months earlier when the body of a 13-year-old girl was found in a desolate patch of forest. She had been stabbed repeatedly. Her eyes had been gouged out. There's a Russian superstition that the last sight that, the, that a murder victim sees uh, is somehow imprinted on the surface of the eye. Soon, two more bodies with similar wounds were discovered. All three had been sexually assaulted. All the bodies were found in the woods near the railway tracks in the Oktyabrsky and Shakhti districts. At first, the brutal and ritualistic nature of the killings led police to suspect a satanic cult was at work or a group harvesting organs to sell for transplant. Police also wondered if a gang of boys from a local home for the mentally handicapped might be responsible. They dubbed the investigation the case of fools. None of these theories panned out. In the Soviet era, local investigators were not prepared to understand the brutal nature of the killings. They had not dealt with anyone of his caliber before. They were reluctant to admit that things uh, like this would occur in a communist state. The best they could do was gather bits of evidence. We got down to serious work, first of all, with the identification of the bodies and then forensic tests of the remains. Despite these efforts, the body count rose. By 1984, we had found 23 bodies. Some of the bodies were still fresh, which gave us a broader picture of the injuries and the killer's behavior at the site of crime. Many of the victims were young girls and boys who had been discovered in the wooded areas around Rostov. All had been mutilated. When they found some of the victims, you could still see the reflection of horror in their eyes. It was very hard to look at because many were just children. There were cut abdomens, amputated breasts. It was horrible to see. And in many cases, it was clear that those body parts had been removed by the teeth of the killer. A lot of the bodies were found near transportation points, bus stations, train stations in particular, which indicated that the killer, whoever he was, was somebody who used the Soviet transportation system extensively. Despite clear evidence that a serial killer was on the loose, Soviet police and the Communist Party-controlled media refused to release any information. In the absence of real facts, rumors spread throughout the region. There were rumors of people with state black limousines, you know, scarfing up children in the countryside. But in the absence of any real media, these children disappeared and nobody knew that they had gone. With no solid suspects, Rostov police began a wide-ranging manhunt, arresting nearly anyone who looked even vaguely suspicious. They had a lot of manpower, and they deployed dozens and dozens of detectives trying to come up with suspects. But for eight years, the killer remained at large. Initially, his victims tended to come more from the ranks of what they called women with disorderly sex lives. But as time went on, he started to take more and more boys, innocent children, whoever he could lure and kill. He chose children whose physical stature made it easy for them to be manipulated. He chose prostitutes who were willing to go with a stranger. Police focused their efforts on transportation hubs. 
they put very high profile police officers, uniforms, etc., in all but a few train stations or bus stations. All the large stations were patrolled by policemen in uniform. We were trying to play on the criminal's emotions and drive him into an isolated location. Undercover officers were used to keep these remote locations under surveillance. In early November, the strategy paid off. A plainclothes detective at an isolated train station spotted a man emerging from the woods. The officer noticed a smear of blood on his cheek and what appeared to be a severe cut on his finger. According to the policeman who was watching him, the suspect washed his shoes and cleaned his coat. The policeman in civilian clothes asked him to show his papers. He identified himself as Andre Chikatilo, a 54-year-old grandfather and loyal Communist Party member. The detective did not have enough reason to hold Chikatilo. He did, however, file a report on the incident. 24 hours later, a passerby discovered a girl's body in the same woods. It happened the next day after Chikatilo had been stopped on the platform. The body had all the typical injuries on it. The chief of police immediately demanded the files of any suspicious individuals who were registered in the last 24 hours. On November 20th, 1990, Andre Chikatilo was apprehended in a Rostov marketplace. Investigators captured the arrest on video. He had come out of the pub with a bottle of beer and tried to make contact with a young boy. We suspected that he might try to lure the boy away. And at that point, Chikatilo was arrested. By now, Chikatilo was suspected of committing more than 30 murders. But the police had no eyewitness and few real clues. Detectives desperately needed proof of his guilt. They needed a confession. They wanted to get the confession. If you read Crime and Punishment uh, by Dostoevsky, I think that uh, you'll see that the confession is a very powerful symbol and very powerful element in Russian culture. Soon, Andrei Chikatilo would reveal the gruesome details of his 12-year run as a sexual predator. It was a tale that would shock a nation. In the annals of crime, Andre Chikatilo is undoubtedly one of the most sadistic killers ever to live. And he got away with murder for more than 12 years. November 1990. Police in Rostov-on-Don, Russia, were interrogating suspected serial killer Andre Chikatilo. For 12 years, a sadistic killer had raped and murdered dozens of women and children. Authorities believed Chikatilo was the culprit. But so far, the father of two had admitted nothing. By law, authorities had 10 days to link him to the murders. Otherwise, Chikatilo would go free. On the ninth day, we invited the psychiatrist Buchanovsky to talk to Chikatilo one-on-one. -on -one. He spent the whole day with Chikatilo from early morning till very late at night. The techniques used by psychiatrist Alexander Bukhanovsky were much different than the intense police interrogation. I explained I wasn't his enemy, also not a defender either. In the medical language, there are no words like guilty and wrong. I wasn't his judge, but just a doctor. Chikatilo opened up to Bukhanovsky. After several hours of conversation, he began to confess his crimes. He probably, in some respects, wanted to be caught. I can't imagine somebody doing that for all those many years and not 
realizing that he was living in a hell of his own creation and, and wanting to be out of it. He took even a kind of smarmy, perverse pride in demonstrating his various techniques, which he did in the KGB gymnasium, where little dummies were used to represent the victims. Not only did Chikatilo admit to the 36 murders of which police were aware, he also described 17 more that they hadn't tied to him. From then we began to collect evidence to prove his connection to the other murders. Chikatilo was more than willing to show how he disarmed people, how he tricked them, how he tied up the boys, how he inflicted the knife wounds, and how he even had sexual relations with his victims, either in the stage of near death or after death. What we do know about the serial killer is when you start to talk with them, they hold everything together. Then they begin to disintegrate, and they begin to be able to share bits, pieces, odds and ends of murders. <laughs> On the evening of December 7, 1990, police drove Chikatilo to the local village of Shakti. Again, one of the officers had a video camera. Walking between the gravestones of a small public cemetery, Chikatilo brought them to the site of a shallow, unmarked grave. Police dug until finally a child sneaker emerged through the earth. Chikatilo watched casually, detached from the proceedings. But these horrors would shock the Soviet nation. What could have created this brutal killer? How could he have killed so many for so long? What would cause a person to slip over that line and become a serial offender of any kind? Andrei Romanovich Chikatilo had started life in a world of violence and human degradation. He was born in 1936 in the Ukrainian village of Yablochnoya. Joseph Stalin ruled the Soviet Union with an iron fist and famines devastated the Ukrainian people. There were serious food shortages in Ukraine, partly as a result of the devastation of the war and partly as a result of the agricultural policies of the Stalin era Soviet Union. Under the banner of collectivism, Stalin forced peasant farmers to deliver their entire crops to the state for nationwide distribution. In the Ukraine itself, however, people were starving. There were outbreaks of mass cannibalism in Russia that were caused simply by hunger. Reports of cannibalism became so frequent, they developed into a kind of folklore. In typical family cannibalism story, my aunt was arrested because she had somebody over for for uh, for a meal and there were fingertips floating in the soup as a young boy andre's own mother told him such a grim tale about a horrific event that had supposedly happened just before he was born his mother used to tell him stories that his older brother was cannibalized uh, because of the famine that was taking place she constantly used it as a warning, don't go out and play after it's dark. They'll grab you and eat you just like they did to your brother Stepan. Her claim that his brother had been cannibalized was impossible to confirm. But psychiatrists speculate that Chikatilo himself might have been traumatized by another crime, an assault on his mother. His sister was born in 1943 during a time when the Germans were occupying a large part of Ukraine where he lived. And his father was supposedly uh, in the Red Army at the time. It's hard to imagine how the father could have gotten back to the family home to impregnate the mother. Uh, and they had a one-room home. So it's quite possible that he saw a German soldier rape his mother. 
Also devastating in the eyes of 13-year-old Andre was the fate of his father, taken prisoner by the Nazis. When Chikatilo's father finally returned home in 1949, he was suffering from tuberculosis. Rather than being rewarded for his war service, he was branded a traitor to the Soviet government. You either died in battle or you triumphed, and there was no third way that was honorable. Stalin's paranoia was such that soldiers who were captured by the Germans and held captive were considered suspect. Although the Communist Party made Andre's father an outcast, Andre's own devotion to the state was such that as a young teen, he became an active member of the Communist Youth League. Chikatilo was very genuine in his belief, in his professed public belief in communism. But with the onset of puberty, young Andre realized that he was not like the other boys in the Youth League. He never fit in very well, and he felt embarrassed and humiliated generally about his lack of sexual prowess. His social circle consisted of much younger children with whom he felt comfortable because they understood him, or elderly people who liked him because he was always a good boy. As a teenager, Andre was attracted to young girls, but he was humiliated when he found himself unable to perform sexually. At that point, he was probably as attractive a man as he was ever going to be, and started having um, courtship with a, with a girl in the village. And his impotence destroyed that relationship. It became a subject of gossip in the village. It was yet another insult to Chikatilo's fragile self-image and a discovery that would torment him all of his life. By 1955, Andre Chikatilo was desperate to escape Ukraine and memories of a miserable youth. By his late teens, Andre knew that he was sexually inadequate. To compensate, Chikatilo decided to better himself in other ways. He set his sights on the prestigious Moscow University, hoping to earn a law degree. But he failed the entrance exam. Disappointed, he entered a vocational school. He wanted to believe in himself as a person who had studied hard, which he in fact had, and gotten a university degree. Not an insignificant accomplishment given his origins. That was another layer of uh, acceptability, if you will. Another layer to cover up what really existed with Chikatilo. In 1963, at the urging of his younger sister, the 28-year-old Chikatilo married. He was living with his sister, and she had a spinster friend. And the two of them were put together. And having no better prospects, they married. His new wife, Theodosia, was a 24-year-old daughter of a coal miner. At last, he had found a person in life with whom he could communicate and relate and be, have some, something approaching normal emotional closeness. He never was capable of normal sexual relations with her, but there was, uh, through a kind of masturbation and insemination process, an effort made to conceive children. In 1965, they were successful. The birth of their daughter, Luda, was followed by a son, Yura, four years later. Chikatilo found work as a communications technician. Throughout this time, he continued his studies, working towards degrees in Marxist-Leninism, engineering, and Russian literature. The family had a balconied second-floor flat in a nondescript block. By Russian standards, it was a pleasant life. Outwardly, Andre was a good husband and father. Theodosia had little reason to complain. She might have felt, well, he's a party member, he, he brings home a salary, he's not drunk, and he doesn't beat me. Um, those last two things would set him apart in a favorable way from a lot of men in the Soviet Union. His marriage, his children, his uh, membership in the Communist Party, that's what everyone saw. But that wasn't his true personality. Chikatilo had erected a modest and respectable facade for the world to see. Inside, however, he was desperately frustrated. Certainly the fact that he was fundamentally impotent 
enraged him greatly because he felt that in some ways he was a superior person having gotten three university degrees. I think he felt throughout his life that he was, that impotence was probably the most fundamental adjective you could use to describe him. In 1970, Chikatilo accepted a job in a secondary school. As a teacher, the 34-year-old hoped to find acceptance and respect, and yet instead he found constant humiliation. His students didn't take him seriously. They refused to behave and smoked right in front of him in the classroom. He was altogether not the kind of person that would hold the attention of a class of children, and they mocked him. He was nicknamed the Goose by his students. And Goose in Russian is kind of like jerk in English. It's someone who inspires zero respect. Worse, Chikatilo found himself enraged by the sight of young people around him falling in love and, in his mind, engaging in sexual activity. One thing that he wanted to change about himself and couldn't change was his sexual impotence. He felt the world had somehow inflicted a tremendous injustice on him. Any low life could enjoy the pleasures of, of uh, sexuality, the joys of love, but he, Chikatilo, the educated, the brilliant, the special, the genius, could not, and that was a source of, of his fundamental rage. In the early 1970s, Chikatilo responded to his anger and frustration by secretly molesting students, both male and female. He felt so profoundly rejected by adults, he was unable to have sexual relationships uh, with uh, consenting adults, so he instead went to vulnerable children. In 1974, he was fired when allegations of his sexual misconduct with students became known. Rather than take the responsibility for exposing him, the director of the school simply got rid of him. Um, and it was typical of what might happen in a Soviet society and probably would happen in any society. Because the incidents were kept quiet, Chikatilo could simply relocate. He moved his family to the nearby town of Shakti. There he found a new position, teaching at vocational school number 33. Chikatilo's wife knew that he had little problems. He was involved with bothering the children at school, but they had put that behind them, and she had forgiven her husband. But unknown to his wife and family, Andre Chikatilo was constructing another life. He bought a second secret house for himself. It was a dilapidated three-room shack on a quiet back street called Mejavoy Lane. And it was the perfect setting for murder. In Shakti, Russia, Andrei Chikatilo seemed to be a devoted family man. His inner life, however, was filled with dark and murderous desires. In 1978, he began to turn these feelings into action. First, he acquired a small shack in a rundown neighborhood. In December, he took a nine-year-old girl there. Her name was Yelena Zakatnova. Her friends called her Lena. He'd met her at a bus stop and offered her something Soviet children rarely enjoyed, bubble gum. She agreed to follow him to the house. He encountered this girl and at first discovered with her that violence on the body of a girl was something that would get him excited. As he began to molest her, he, he, he grew increasingly excited and wanted more direct sexual contact with her. He was unable to perform sexually, so he used a knife instead. It was the moment when he discovered that murder was his passion. After that, he knew himself in a new way. Afterward, he carried Lena to the nearby Grushevka River. He set her body in the water then tossed her school bag after her. She was found two days later. Although policemen investigating the case came across some bloodstains near Andre Chikatilo's secret house, he was not considered the prime suspect. The problem is, from the point of view of the police, that he had no criminal record. Um, he was a party member. He had a wife. He had children. Um, 
he did not fall into any of the categories that they were used to be used to looking for criminals in. Rather than focusing on Chikatilo, police found someone they deemed a more appropriate suspect, a local man who had spent time in prison for rape. He was later convicted and executed. Having killed for pleasure, Andre Chikatilo was now able to erase the sense of impotence he'd felt all his life. He had gained a piece of self-knowledge that he could never shake, which was that what turned him on was powerlessness and ultimately the murder of another person. Still, coming so close to being caught had frightened Chikatilo. For the next two years, he went to work, spent time with his wife and children, read the papers, and waited. He quit teaching to become a supply supervisor, or Tolkach, a position unique to the dysfunctional Soviet economic system, where contracts for raw materials often went unfulfilled. The job of a Tolkach was to go around to the various enterprises and try to get them to send the cement or send the rubber or send the steel or whatever it was that was necessary. It was normal for him to go on the road for several days to visit the supplying enterprises for his own enterprises and be gone without any supervision. It was not a particularly prestigious job for a man of Chikatilo's education. He traveled by train to various factories, trying to maintain the image of a dutiful Soviet citizen. He does have a struggle. Uh, I don't think he just gives himself over to, I am evil, personified. I think he says, what I'm thinking, what I'm wanting to do is not, uh, is not healthy, it's not good. In the case of someone like Chikatilo, the brilliance and the strength of the person was in this iron discipline of keeping the two halves of his personality utterly separate. For over two years, Chikatilo managed to keep his murderous rage under control. But finally, the dark side of his personality resurfaced. On September 3, 1981, while passing a library in Rostov-on-Don, Chikatilo spotted 17-year-old Larissa Chichenko. She agreed to take a walk with him along the Don River. Instead, he steered her into the woods Again, Chikatilo was unable to perform sexually, but he remembered what had satisfied him two years earlier in the secret house on Mejavoy Lane. He would attempt to have sex, normal sex with the woman. He would inevitably fail. That would release the great rage that lived and lurked inside of Chikatilo. Sex was the vehicle, uh, but the, 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 the basic uh, need was to feel a sense of power over his victims. Chikatilo killed with even more brutality than before. He stabbed his victim repeatedly, then savagely bit her. He was really getting even. He was angry with humanity, but especially with women. He was seeking revenge, and he was getting revenge against the people who rejected him the most. With this second murder, the veneer of Chikatilo's normal life shattered. A pathology spawned by years of frustration took over. Chikatilo became a serial killer. He was a man who was impotent. What does the word impotent mean? It means literally without power. So in every case, whether he was dealing with the young boys, the young girls, or the uh, young women, it was essential for Chikatilo to establish uh, physical dominance and control over the victim. Gratification has been mixed up with anger and hostility, and one complements the other to the degree that you can't even separate them. He became intensely excited and even uh, would spontaneously ejaculate during that mutilation that had taken place. Then he cut off pieces of his victim's bodies. Chikatilo admitted making the incisions, admitted removing the uterus, but would never quite cop to the fact that he ate the uterus. He said, I like to nibble on it. 
They were so pink and springy, those were the words he used. What had started as a quest for sexual satisfaction had now become a murder spree, the worst in Russian history. Nineteen eighty four, Rostov on Don, Russia. Andrei Chikatilo had now murdered twenty three people. Faced with these brutal killings, police began to question anyone who looked suspicious. On September thirteenth, two Rostov detectives spotted a six foot tall man wearing a black fur cap. He was trying to make conversation with a young girl. It was decided not to detain him on the spot, but follow up and see what he was going to do. The officers tailed the suspect as he approached one young woman after another. Eventually, they observed him fondling a prostitute in a deserted station. This act of public lewdness was enough for detectives to arrest the man. He identified himself as Andre Chikatilo. He was carrying a small leather case. He had a, a, a briefcase, and in the briefcase was Vaseline, ropes, and knives. Well, that sounds to me like what we refer to as a kill kit. But after questioning Chikatilo, investigators discovered that he was a devoted family man and a loyal Communist Party member. He was eventually released. They were looking for a young killer uh, who had a criminal record, who might have been uh, known as a, as a sexual pervert in his community. He had gray hair, thick glasses. He was tall and skinny with a little pouch of a belly. He seemed to be just another face in the crowd of people that you would see in a provincial Soviet city. In addition, Police laboratories mishandled a blood test that could have tied Chikatilo to the crimes. Well, the Russian police were, first of all, technologically in the Stone Age and uh, in terms of organization were on that level as well. So typically blood and sperm samples would get lost. That in itself was an example of the failures of Soviet science and, and, and of Soviet production capabilities. Chikatilo was free to kill again. Police were desperate to stop the attacks, so they decided to try an American criminological technique, psychological profiling. Psychiatrist Alexander Bukhanovsky was recruited to create a psychological portrait of the killer. Preparing the criminal's profile took several months of hard work. I had access to top-secret materials that have never been published. By analyzing this evidence, Bukhanovsky painted an intriguing description of the killer. Bukhanovsky said that the criminal was unsociable, that he was very ill. He stressed sexual perversions. He said the criminal could either be living on his own or with a wife, but he didn't have a sexual relationship with her. Yet it would take police another six years to capture Chikatilo. A lot of the factors that caused the demise of the Soviet Union were also at work in the Chikatilo case and, and enabled him to kill as long as he did and as many people as he did without being caught. Finally, on November 20th, 1990, after a 12-year killing spree and 52 victims, Andrei Chikatilo was arrested. Dr. Bukhanovsky's profile would prove chillingly accurate. In his confessions, he says uh, he enjoyed their cries, he enjoyed the blood, and he enjoyed their pain. Well, he's obviously a sexual sadist. What the serial murderer learns with the act of his first murder is that he can be in control because until this time they've basically been the scattered pieces of an individual that has never made them feel that they are in charge the most serious motivating force for a lot of people if not all people is sex 
some kind of the desire to, to, to procreate, the desire to be a sexual being. And in his case, it was just a totally frustrated, humiliating uh, failure that he struggled with all of his life. Spring 1992, Andre Chikatilo, 56-year-old grandfather and loyal party member, stood accused of a string of gruesome and brutal murders. The Soviet Union had collapsed, becoming the Commonwealth of Independent States. Chikatilo's trial promised to be the first great spectacle of the post-Soviet era. The Russian people reacted with grim fascination. Once Chikatilo's case became more or less public knowledge, the local people were hideously aware that a serial killer was in their midst, and nothing spreads faster in, in Russia than rumor. And soon, Chikatilo would be given a nickname befitting his murderous deeds. The Butcher of Rostov. April 14th, 1992, in the Russian city of Rostov-on-Don, citizens flooded the steps of the House of Justice, anxious for a glimpse of the accused killer, Andrei Chikatilo. For months, newspaper headlines had branded him the Red Ripper, or the Butcher of Rostov. Chikatilo was dressed in a souvenir Olympic sports shirt provided by the court. His head had been shaved, a standard procedure to guard against lice. As proceedings began, the setting resembled a circus more than a murder trial. He was in a large iron cage in the courtroom. The cage was to protect him from the rage of the parents of the victims. He was never able to sit at a table and converse with his lawyer the way a Western defendant would have been. It was a bizarre scene in the public seating you had a number of family members of victims who were quite vehement in their desire to see him executed and if they had had the option of seeing him executed by having wolves tear him apart they would have voted for that the victim's parents reaction was understandably strong when he was put in his cage people rushed towards it and shouted Give him to us. But how else would you expect the parents who lost their children to behave? On the opposite end of the courtroom, Justice Leonid Akupchyanov presided, flanked by ordinary citizens, the Russian equivalent of the Western jury. The judge read the list of charges. The volume of evidence filled 222 casebooks. The story they told was grim and horrifying in its details. The victims' ages varied from nine years old to 45. They were both male and female. The ultimate point of the sexual act is to create life. Chikatilo's idea of it was that it should climax in death, so he was, he was Mr. Anti-Sex, Mr. Anti-Life. It took two days for the judge to read through his list of indictments. On April 16th, the defendant was allowed an opportunity to address the court. Families of Chikatilo's victims screamed insults. Some fainted. In a rambling two-hour statement, Chikatilo described himself as a man robbed of his genitals. Born impotent, Chikatilo claimed to be cursed by a lifetime of sexual frustration that had eventually driven him to murder. He asserted that he had never planned to kill, but that he had been seized with shaking and shivering and had lost control. He seemed at various times intent on proving that he was crazy. Um, at some points that I witnessed, he jumped up and started shouting at the judge and then dropped his pants and exposed himself. Um, at other times, he started cursing and screaming and so forth. Most observers believed Chikatilo's behavior in the courtroom was an act, an effort to gain sympathy. If found criminally insane, Chikatilo could be placed in a psychiatric hospital. If judged sane, however, he faced execution. In Russia, that meant a single bullet to the back of the head. 
the definition of sanity and insanity from the legal point of view, which, which is an international definition and was used in the Soviet Union, was can the person in question tell the difference between right and wrong? The trial would continue for six months. Throughout, Chikatilo presented himself as a wretched victim of nature's indifference and a gruesome metaphor for Russia's 70-year failed social experiment. When he was defending himself, he blamed Stalin, he blamed his parents, he blamed the cannibalism of the famine, he blamed the Communist Party, and he even blamed his own blood type. Prosecutors would argue that Andrei Chikatilo was in fact the most calculating, diabolical killer of all time. His crimes were sickening, but I don't think he was sick in the psychiatric or legal sense. Certainly not insane. He was more bad than he was mad, and, and he was certainly very crafty, but he wasn't crazy. October 14th, 1992, would signify the day of reckoning for serial murderer Andrei Chikatilo. It had taken nearly two months for Judge Leonid Akubzhanov to write his final verdict. Everybody knew he was going to be convicted. Uh, everybody knew what the sentence was going to be. Um, but there was, I guess, some value in going through the ritual. After a 12-year murder spree, final justice came swiftly. On February 15, 1994, Andrei Chikatilo was escorted through the halls of Rostov prison and led to a private cell. There he was executed by a single shot behind the right ear. In the aftermath of his execution, writers, reporters, and victims' families attempted to find some trace of humanity in Andrei Chikatilo. But in many ways, this man, who committed extraordinarily cruel crimes, remains an enigma. He spoke himself of some of his motivations, and yet when you hear any single explanation, it never rings with sufficient truth to explain the hideous crimes that this man committed. Having seen the dead bodies of so many victims, it may have seemed natural for me to hate him. And that is what I felt until Chikatilo was finally captured. At that point, I realized that Chikatilo wasn't in control of what he was doing. He was a very sick person, acting against his will. Whether you believe that he was the victim of the circumstances under which he was born, or whether you believe he was an evil person who used free will to do what he did and wanted to kill. Um, that evil that grew in him is not something that's alien to all of us. Perhaps the final judgment on the life of Andre Chikatilo was written by the killer himself, an expression of guilt and self-loathing that at the same time hints at his gruesome, violent nature. And now my brain should be taken apart, piece by piece, and examined, so there wouldn't be any others like me.